to First United Methodist Church in Hollidaysburg, our online service. Thank you so much for joining us. This week we are celebrating the fourth week of Advent. So we light the fourth candle, remembering that we are expecting Jesus the Christ child to come and be born in our hearts again. Thank you for joining us. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping this this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing thanks thanks to bring him Lord the day the son of Mary nails and spears shall pierce him through the cross be born for me for you hail hail the word made flesh the babe the son of Mary is Christ the King who shepherds God and angels sing thanks thanks to bring him Lord the babe the son of Mary Come, peasant king, to own him, the king of kings, salvation brings, let loving hearts and throne him. This, this is Christ, the king, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. King, whom the shepherds guard, and angels sing. Thanks, thanks to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary, the babe, the son of Mary, the babe, the son of Mary. Will you please join me in a time of prayer? God, it's hard to believe that we are already here. The fourth week of Advent, barreling toward Christmas Day when we remember the birth of your Son, our Savior. God, I ask in this harried week, that you help us to carve out times of quiet with you. I ask that you help us to, that you help us to really focus on your love this season. And God, I ask that we be sensitive to those for whom the holidays are not joyful or happy. People who are celebrating without loved ones, people who have memories from past holidays that are not good or healthy or helpful. God, we thank you that you never leave us. And I ask that your presence and your peace 
be, be felt in this week and be felt into the new year. Guide us to have open hearts to help those who are struggling this season. Help us to be a community of faith that cares, that shines your light and shares your love. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, I'm Coco. I haven't seen you in church for a while. You've been pretty busy. Oh, yeah, Pastor John. Well, what have you been busy with? I have a new girlfriend. Oh, you have a new girlfriend. What's her name? Cindy. Oh, Cindy. Is she cute? Uh-huh. I am bananas over her. Well, I bet she's pretty nice. What do you think you're going to get her for Christmas? You mean I'm to get her a present? Well, yeah, normally if people like somebody, they, they buy Christmas presents to give to them. So maybe you could get her some, uh, some chocolates or some flowers or maybe a nice electronic gadget. Oh, I think I'll get her an x rox You're going to get her x lax No, x box Oh, X-Box. That's, that's a really expensive gift, Coco. Did, did she really like playing games? No, I like playing games. Well, Coco, you don't buy somebody a present because it's something you enjoy. You, you need to buy someone a present because it's, it's, it's something they enjoy. Oh. You see, we've been in this series uh, called What God Wants for Christmas and trying to decide what it is we're going to give God for Christmas. And you know what God wants most of all? What's well, that? He wants us. He wants us to give our lives for him, to offer him our complete selves. That is the best gift of all. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, yeah, we need to give ourselves to Jesus. In fact, why don't we do that now and pray? Lord Jesus, help us to give ourselves to you, every part of us. Amen. Amen. Hey, I hope it goes well with you and Cindy. <laughs> I'll let you know. All right. Bye-bye, Coco. Bye-bye. Our scripture lesson comes to us from Luke's gospel, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little away from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night, all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they'd done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Word of God for the people of God. You know, Jesus received some obscure and strange gifts in his lifetime. But of all those gifts, what was the best? What was the greatest gift of all? Often at Christmas time, our minds go to those magi, the wise men bringing their gifts of gold, frankincense, myrrh. 
unusual gifts, uh, gold for royalty, myrrh, ointment for a corpse, uh, frankincense to be burned in the presence of the divine. They knew Jesus was a king, that he was holy and that he would die. Now for Mary, Joseph, and the baby, that gold would have come in very handy as they were refugees to Egypt. But you have to wonder, what happened to the frankincense and the myrrh? <laughs> eh, here's a gift for Uncle Charlie. Let's re-gift this one. Huh? You know, it's not like they could put it in a storage unit when they had to flee. Some gifts are bizarre. Stop and think about that alabaster box of pure nard. Do you remember very costly perfume that was broken, poured out on Jesus' head, preparing him for his burial? An exceedingly expensive gift, yet very unusual. Or think of the gift of Joseph of Arimathea, someone who would offer his very own tomb that had just been hewn out of the rock for the corpse of Jesus to be placed. Hey, but it was only a borrowed gift, right? Jesus only needed that three days. Just borrowed it for Friday, Saturday, early Sunday. He was out of there. Praise Jesus, huh? Unusual gifts. But you know, I think perhaps the best gift Jesus ever received Fishnets. You see, for Peter, Andrew, James, and John, when they laid down their nets, they laid down their lives. It was an act of total surrender. And as we're in this series about what God wants for Christmas, um, that is something he yearns from each and every one of us, to surrender our lives, to give our complete selves. For James, John, and Peter, it had to be extremely frustrating. If you've ever been out fishing and you haven't caught a thing, nothing stinks like getting skunked. Huh? But for these men, fishing was their livelihood. If fish was what put meat on the table, or fish on the table, if you would. And if there was no catch, there was no income. And if there was no income, it made things rather difficult. But there they were early in the morning cleaning their nets, washing them. And in comes some itinerant rabbi. And he suddenly sits down in Peter's boat and asks to be put out to shore. And from there he uses that rabbi raft as a pulpit. We don't know what his words were. We don't know if it was a sermon or teaching or exactly what he talked about. But when he was done... Peter, who probably has been speaking some choice expletives, wanting to get out of there, wanting to go home and go to bed, here's this rabbi tell him, put out to the deep water and cast down your nets. His response, come on, buddy. We fished all night. We caught nothing. <laughs> if there are fish in this Galilean lake, we're not going to find them here, so why even bother? But he humors the guy. If you say so. And so they go out to the deep water, and with a casting of nets, they bring in this haul like they have never seen in their entire lives. That there are so many fish that the nets are starting to rip. So many fish that it's not only weighing down that boat, they bring in the boat of James and John, and the boats are ready to sink because they have never seen a catch like that in their lives blown away by that miraculous catch they had back to shore. And what is the response of Simon Peter? Get away from me, man. I'm, a, I'm too sinful. Can, can you imagine what he's thinking? Look, guy, I got too many skeletons in my closet. I got too many barnacles on my boat. I got too much baggage that I'm hauling here, and I can't be in the presence of somebody like you. And don't we feel like that so much? Maybe even those of you who haven't been to church since the pandemic hit, thinking, well, I can't go back now. I'm 
too screwed up. Some might even think, you know, as soon as I get this addiction under control, then I'm going to get right with Jesus, right? As soon as I deal with this unforgiveness issue, with this conflict in my family, then that'll be okay. As soon as this divorce is settled and I don't have to deal with this baggage, then I'll get back. That's not what God asks. He he simply speaks the word. He says, follow me. He doesn't say, clean yourself up and then come follow. No. With all of our barnacles, all of our brokenness, all of our fish guts, all of our mess, all of our problems, he still speaks the word, just come. Man, that's hopeful for us, isn't it? Broken people that we are, because we're all broken, and we're all sinners who need a Savior. And Jesus doesn't say, you clean yourself up first, then you come. He simply says, come. And so this amazing transformation takes place. That for Simon, for James, for John, they drop their nets. And from that moment on, they're not just blown away with an amazing catch. They're going to be catching people, a totally different catch because their lives are radically transformed. You see, when we meet Jesus and we surrender, that's a huge change because this point stops. We're no longer doing what we always did and having what we always had. We suddenly are different because we're following him. And if we are following Jesus, we do not dictate to him, this is what I will do. This is where I will go. This is how I will accomplish what I want to accomplish. No. When we follow Jesus, it's, it's what he wants. It's his plan. It's his direction. It's his purposes. It's his will. Nothing more and nothing less and nothing else than to do the very thing he calls us to do, to seek him, to, to go in his direction. That's what we are called to do is surrender. Uh, Oswald Chambers, the great devotional writer, would put it this way in his devotion, My Utmost for Esaias. Be reckless immediately totally unrestrained and willing to risk everything by casting your all upon him. You do not know when his voice will come to you, but whenever the realization of God comes, even in the faintest way imaginable, be determined to recklessly abandon yourself, surrendering everything to him. It's only through abandonment of yourself and your circumstances that you'll recognize him. You will only recognize his voice more clearly through recklessness, being willing to risk your all. Now, Chambers is not saying that we need to throw caution to the wind and we need just to be wild and crazy and reckless. No, that's not what he's referring to. He's referring to this point that you are giving everything to God. It's almost like your life is represented by this blank sheet of paper and you are signing at the bottom and saying, here you go, God. You fill in whatever you want to fill in. I mean, that's gutsy, and that's bold. And we might think, wow, I can't believe that these fishermen would give up their livelihood, give up everything that was familiar to just follow this this rabbi. But the call is no less for any of us. We are to lay down our lives to follow the fisher of men. Right? Right? And too often we allow our lives to still be about what they've always been about. Uh, But we're we're called to be those who catch people as well. We are to reach out to others and share with them this good news of life in Christ, of of hope that we have, of salvation that that is achieved. See, for each of us, what we are to offer to God for Christmas is ourselves. Warts and all. Huh? Our brokenness, our beauty, our hardships, our, our happiness, our tumultuous moments, our terrific moments. Right? 
we hand it all over. We give it all to God. William Booth was an amazing leader in the life of the church and starting the Salvation Army. Such a successful ministry that continues this day in so many places. And someone once asked him, look, um, what's the secret of your success? I mean, how is it that that God has used you to do these amazing things? Uh, This was his response. Uh, I'll tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I have, men with greater opportunities. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what God could do with them, on that day I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth there was. What was the secret? It was relinquishment. It was total surrender. It was Offering control to God, giving himself up. And are we there? In our live services for this weekend, we're going to have an altar call that is inviting people to come and to pray. And you don't have that luxury where you are online, but yet you do. You can take a whole lot more time than what anyone who is in a live service is doing because you have the ability to pause your worship. I would challenge you to surrender your life to Jesus. And maybe some of you, you're feeling like Simon Peter, that I'm not worthy. I, I can't follow Jesus. I can't do any of this. I'm too messed up. No. He doesn't call those who are qualified He simply extends the call. And if you feel today you're not worthy, guess what? Not a single person in the life of this church or any church is worthy because we are broken with our baggage. The thing we all have in common is we're sinners that we need a Savior. And that's why Jesus came to to die, to rescue us from sin. So maybe for the first time today, you'd like to bring that brokenness and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Just be brutally honest. It's his job to clean you up. It's his job to put you on the right direction. Your job is simply to say yes. So maybe today you want to say yes to Jesus. Uh, For others listening today, maybe you know that you have done that. But um, they're just things that are holding you back. Things that you own, things that you possess or that possess you. But Perhaps there's never been that time when you fully surrendered. When you said, Lord, take all of me. Why not take all of me? Uh, That's what he wants from us. So maybe you'd like to take these moments now to say, Lord, my gift for you this Christmas is, it's me. It's every part of me. It's what he yearns for, for us, as Paul would write to the church in Rome, to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. That's a reasonable act of worship. That's what's reasonable, huh, for us to fully give ourselves. So may that be the gift that we offer, the one who offers his life to us. Allow me to pray as we wrap things up. Uh, Jesus, the call is no less urgent of what you gave those men at the Galilean Lake, the call to come and follow you. So, Lord, we pray you would help us in laying down our nets, whatever form that manifests itself, if it's what's comfortable, if it's our livelihood, Lord, may we lay down whatever you call us to lay down. May we truly be changed and transformed as we seek you and go the direction where you lead us. Lord, for any today who come with brokenness, uh, we all do. But Lord, some this day are saying, Jesus, I want to follow you for the first time. Lord, help them when those steps. Help them to know that their, their sins are forgiven because of what you did on Calvary. And Lord, not only that, when you rose from the dead, you defeated death and you've given us victory 
to live for you in a new and different way. So help them, help each of us as we walk with you and follow you. And Lord, for each of us, help us with this this issue of surrender. It's so easy to hold on to stuff, but Lord, may we let it go. May we drop our nets, drop whatever's necessary at your feet, that we might be freed to serve you and do whatever it is you ask of us to do. Give us ears that are open, hearts that are willing to serve and to love, to be about catching people. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you so much for your gifts, whether they be online or you send them in the mail or drop them off. Um, a couple of weeks ago, our youth group baked cookies and made treats and created boxes to take those treats to our American rescue workers here in Hollidaysburg to thank the volunteers and staff there. They took a box of these cookies and treats to the staff at the Blair County Prison as a thank you, and they took another box to the staff at the courthouse here in Hollidaysburg as a thank you. It is your gifts that allow ministry like that to happen, that allow us to share God's love with people who are sometimes overlooked. And now may the God of the universe his Son, Jesus, who is love, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.
Thank you.